working with our thinking is a much subtler thing than we might have imagined. It's not a matter of exerting our will. It's not a matter of making an effort or forcing. And the reason for that is because whenever we try to force something or make an effort in order to make it happen, that always comes out of our thinking. So what happens is that I have an idea that things should be different to the way that they are. So then I strain in order to make them be different. Or I have an idea of how they should be some specific way. And so I strain in order to make them be that way. And that always comes out of a basic model or logical picture of the world. Because there always has to be this idea of either things not being the way I want them to be, which is to say things being wrong, or having an idea of some ideal state of affairs that I would like to accord with or reach. So forcing or purposefulness or effort always comes out of a thought or a thought created structure and for that reason it can't be used to work with thoughts because clearly there's a loop going on there and what this loop does is our attempts to regulate our thoughts or change them in some way strengthens the thoughts so the more we try to change our thoughts, the more we are at the mercy of our thoughts. Because we're using the very thing that we want to tone down in order to do this procedure of toning down thinking. So we, we're using the thing that is the problem in order to solve the problem. And when we're not subtle enough in our way of understanding things, this is always a problem we fall into. So it's an inevitable problem. It's a problem that we keep on running into time and time again. The problem of using the thing that is the problem to solve the problem. And this is a trap because we don't understand it. We're not subtle enough in our perceptions to see what's going on here. So we've tried to work with thought. But we're trying to work with thought in a crude way without realising that we have to look into it much more than we have up to this point. So when we do look into it, when we do look into this matter of what thought is, we can see that all thoughts are essentially supposition, suppositions. They have a thought as a suppositional nature. which means, in, a, in, a, in effect, that when we think we're jumping to conclusions, or making hypotheses. So when I think something, I'm really making a hypothesis, which means that what I think should be prefixed by, it is as if. So too, copy Robert Anton Wilson's example, if I see someone who annoys me, what I really ought to say to, to draw attention to the propositional or suppositional nature of my thoughts, I ought to say, 
It is as if that guy is a total bastard, or it is as if that guy is a complete fool, or etc. etc. But I don't do that, of course. <clears throat> we all know that's not the way it works. I just come right out and say whatever it is I'm going to say about him. I say, that guy's a bastard, that guy's a fool, that guy's etc. etc. So, what I've done then. I've ignored the propositional or hypothetical nature of my assertions about reality. Converting them into is-type assertions. X is Y. You are a this, I am a that. Which means that I'm denying the propositional nature of thought. Now this is the root problem for us because once we do that we get trapped in thought because anything that is, is and that is doesn't brook any questioning so thought creates final realities in other words thought is a description but it is also a final reality when we forget that it is only a hypothetical description of how things could be or might be or that the thought in question is things could be like this possibly if we choose to look at it in this way which is a very nicely relativized statement even if it is a bit of a mouthful I can look at things in such a way so as to produce this conclusion or this apparently valid description. So when we forget the suppositional or propositional, I'm not really sure which is the best word to use there, nature of thought, it's handy and it's quick, it's a convenience, I don't want to have to go through that and um, acknowledgement of the relativity of my statements every time. But out of this, out of this cutting corners, comes the comes the thought as and is um, assertion, which means that I'm creating a final reality, and the whole thing about final realities is that they're final. We get trapped in them. It's an absolute rubber stamp. So if I say everything is terrible, that is a rubber stamp. If everything is terrible, then that's just terrible. There's nothing to do but cower under the weight of this, of the dreadful finality inherent in my somewhat negative thought there. But well, I am a terrible person. It's the same thing. It comes down like a ton of bricks. I'm a terrible person. What do I do with that? Where do I go with that? And the answer is I don't go anywhere. I just get buried under all those bricks. So these are, those two examples are dramatic examples, but most of our thoughts aren't as dramatic as that. Most of our thoughts are not at all dramatic, but they all have this final nature. They all have this literal nature. And it's only when thoughts do become quite dramatic and quite negative that we want to find out how to work with them. Naturally enough. So if I do have this thought, I'm a terrible person. I will suffer away under this thought for a while however long, but it won't give me any breaks because it's not really going to cut me any slack. Clearly it's not going to cut me any slack at all. I'm a terrible person and that's the end of it. That's a judgment. Judgments don't cut any slack. And the mind always judges, even though we don't realise it. The thinking mind operates on the basis of judgments, finalities. <clears throat> And that's a very inhospitable, that's a very inimicable place to live in a world made up of judgments. 
if we're living in that world, then we're going to have a hard time. There's no room in such a world for life, essentially. So the mind, when it functions in this way, and we are, can't do anything about it but submit to what it tells us about reality, the thinking mind is actually anti-life at that stage because it's creating judgments about everything and judgments do not allow life because life isn't a thing that can be either good or bad or this or that or winning or losing or whatever life is a process of constant becoming as or constant change as Heraclitus pointed out two and a half thousand years ago or whatever however long it was so really we're trying to catch things in a net of literal statements when we think. Now whatever the hell we catch in that net, it's not going to be reality because reality cannot be brought to heel using literal statements. So that's okay as a bit of philosophy, but when it comes down to The actual very personal matter of me being afflicted by negative self-judgmental thoughts or some other type of negative thoughts. I need to know how to work with those things in a helpful way rather than an unhelpful way. And what we almost always do is that we try to work with those thoughts by thinking about them in a different way. which is what I was saying at the beginning of this discussion. But yet, because a thought is a final statement, and because it is the, the fact that final statements are imprisoning and crushing of the spirit, we could say, even if that sounds somewhat non-scientific, to use more final statements, which are just as final as our first statements, is not in any way going to help our situation. Lots of little final statements can't get rid of one big final statement. Thoughts can't get rid of thoughts, or they can't tone them down. What I really need to do is not counterbalance a positive, a negative final statement with a positive one, everything is great, etc, etc which is a ridiculous pendulum, good, bad, I'm great, I'm terrible, whatever. We can get caught up in that pendulum forever. And whatever good it seems to be doing us is amply compensated for by the bad it does us a bit later on, and so on and so forth. So that really is a trap, trying to counteract the negative with the positive. What really does help is to find some way of, it's almost as if we're getting an eraser and we're just rubbing out that, that sharp line that thought has made. So it's no longer a line, we're, we're depotentiating, it's no longer a final reality, it's just a hypothesis a proposition. So we're trying to tone it down in that way. Now the key point and the key understanding here is that this cannot be done with thinking. Now at the risk of repeating myself innumerable times, which we need to do because we always try and cure thought with thought. It's, thought is our only tool in our toolbox. It's the only thing we have at our disposal. Dispos dispos we always try to use thought to fix thought, which is washing off blood with blood, as Zen saying it. You might think you're getting somewhere, but you're not really. So working with thinking doesn't involve more thinking. And in addition, we can say that working with thinking is not something that we can deliberately do with the point of view of fixing that thinking or changing it in some way. So once we understand that, 
we are relieved of a terrible burden, which is the burden of trying to change something. So how we work with thinking is to be aware of thinking as a supposition or a proposition or a hypothesis, which means not immediately believing thought, in a fraction of a second totally believing it. Now, if someone came up to you and told you any kind of a stuff, any kind of a thing, you're not going to believe it straight away instantaneously. Probably you're not, unless you're unusually gullible or unusually suggestible. It's possible to be in a state of mind like that. <clears throat> but whenever you find yourself, or if you were to find yourself, wandering around in a state of immense gullibility or immense suggestibility, you know that you're going to be in trouble. People are going to exploit the hell out of you because that's what people do when they find someone who's a bit gullible or a bit suggestible. And one way they might just make fun of you and <clears throat> tell you stupid things to enjoy looking at you and seeing that you believe them. <clears throat> or probably they will rip you off in some way because that's the game. That's how it works. So we all know that's the game and we all get pretty canny about it and we don't believe what comes out of people's mouths that much. Now, as soon as I said that, I kind of think, okay, Maybe we're not that canny because we seem to believe what comes out of politicians' mouths very easily. And politicians are well known for being the greatest liars of all. But still, leaving that aside, on in the case of normal human interaction, we don't automatically believe everything someone tells us. They'd have to put up a convincing case or we'd have to trust them. So what we need to do is bring that canniness, that lack of gullibility to bear on thinking so that without fighting against the thinking or trying to change it, which is going down the wrong road straight away, that's playing into the hands of the adversary, we bring our awareness to bear on the thinking. And that allows us, by being aware of our thinking, properly aware of it, rather than just automatically believing it in a flash, that allows us to see its true nature, which is not a final description of reality at all, but a proposition. It's like the thinking is saying, hey, reality could be like this. So that's what every thought is saying to us. Only somehow, because we've become unaware, because thought has ended up in a position where it's controlling us, which it shouldn't be, there's no more question of a, a thought telling us, hey, it's as if reality is like this, which would be very... Um, nice for thought to be like that. It would be very non-aggressive, but thought isn't. Thought is aggressive. Thought just weighs right in there and tells us this is how it is. Like um, some kind of dogmatic, fundamental religious guy with a big beard. Hey, reality is like this. And if you don't like it, well, you know what's going to happen to you. So that's dogmatic aggressive, assertive thought, and that is the adversary, because it is anti-life, as I was saying earlier. Ultimately, it will create more and more suffering for us. It will strangle us more and more. It will leave us with less and less. It will, de it will deteriorate, or deteriorate our quality of life more and more. <clears throat> because anything that's anti-life is going to do that. Final realities will always do that. On the one hand, we like final realities because of the security that's in them. But the final realities, will all, when we believe in them, will always cause the quality of our, life, of our lives to deteriorate and deteriorate. So there's more and more suffering and discomfort and lack of peace. 
as time goes on and it just it only ever gets worse. So just to come back to the point that being able to be aware of thoughts isn't something that can come out of thought. Thought can never tell me how to be aware of thought. Because as soon as I allow thought to tell me something, I'm not aware because that's the way it works. Thought is in control there. So the only thing that does work is constant practicing. I practice all day long. Every thought that comes along, I practice with it. When I remember, when I don't remember, I don't practice with it. But if I'm at all interested in working with thought, then ever so often I will remember. And it's like, ah, I'm being caught out here. Thought is catching me out, or thought just did catch me out. So this is what's going on. Thought comes along and it tries to catch us out. We're gullible. I'm gullible and I go, oh, it tells me something negative and my spirit sinks down to my boots and I go, oh. Or equally, it tells me something positive and I go, I get a rush of euphoria, which is equally stupid and equally useless and equally playing into the hands of the adversary. So that's what thought does. And if I'm interested in working with thought and not being the victim of thought, if I'm interested in not being thought's puppet or the gimp of thought, thought's gimp, then I will practice bringing awareness to that situation. And in the initial stages, it is, of course, going to be the case that Thoughts will win more rounds, but that's okay. I don't have to be the all-time winner straight away because that's not how reality works. But if there is an interest on my part, and that really is the crucial thing, if there is that interest on my part in working with my thoughts and not just being subjugated by them, then what follows on from that interest is consciousness. And consciousness always grows slowly. It's not like switching on a light switch. Although sometimes great awareness can happen like that. But then it goes out again just as easy. But what we're talking about is organically developing consciousness at a slow pace, which is the natural pace. Now, if I'm in a great hurry to get somewhere, that's just thought making me in a great hurry, and so I'm not going to get anywhere. But if I'm just interested, then I'll keep on practicing. And as I keep on practicing, as time goes on, thought will catch me out less and less often. So as Pema Chodron says, a thought comes along and I smile at it. Smiling isn't a strategy. So Pema Chodron isn't advocating this psychological technique of smiling at your thought. You could imagine someone putting on this terrible grimace on their face and attempting to smile on purpose at a thought. That is just... Um, trying to mimic a natural process. The smiling happens of itself as soon as we see the thought to be a non-final reality or purely propositional reality or guess. And we see that thought is presenting that as a final reality, but we can see that it isn't. And so then we're not being caught out by thought. We're not being tricked by thought. Thought is the door-to-door -door salesman. And we're smiling at him in a polite way or in a cheerful way, not a malicious way. And we're saying, no, thank you. Okay, thanks for watching.